Welcome to Shipwreck Sunday, where we investigate disasters at sea and the impact that they have on the world today. My name is Eleanor. Today, we will be exploring the tragic sinking of SS Atlantic, the first enormous sea disaster for the White Star Line before RMS Titanic. Before we dive in, I must inform you. The story does include details of a maritime disaster resulting in the sinking of a vessel, death, and death and injury to children that may be disturbing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Please note before we begin that I am not a mariner or expert in the field of maritime history, but I have done my research and will present the information as I understand it and with accurate nautical terminology. Before we get started, we will go over the basics of nautical terminology. The bow is the very front part of the ship, and the very back end of it is called the stern. The port side is the left, and the starboard side is the right. Propellers are sometimes referred to as screws. The hull is the metal sides of the ship, the keel is the very bottom of it, and the superstructure is the top deck, usually made of wood. Smokestacks, or funnels, are large tunnels on top of the ship used to direct steam and smoke away from the deck. Masts are large wooden poles on the deck of the ship, usually used to hoist sails or hold a crow's nest where crew members can see for miles around the vessel. Beam is a measurement that refers to the width of a ship. With that out of the way, we begin our story in 1870 in the Harland and Wolfe shipping yard in Belfast, Ireland. After acquiring the White Star Line, Thomas Ismay ordered four ships known as the Oceanic class, later ordering two more ships to this four-ship fleet. Oceanic class's second ocean liner was the SS Atlantic, and her keel was laid in yard number 74. All of the Oceanic class liners were roughly the same specifications with minor variations, being large and luxurious. SS Atlantic was 421.3 feet in length, had a 40.7 foot beam, and a 31.4 foot draft. For anyone who is unfamiliar, draft refers to the depth of water needed for a vessel to float freely, and is measured from the keel to the waterline. She had five bulkheads fitted with watertight compartments. SS Atlantic had four decks total, including a large boat deck that was sectioned for crew and saloon class. She was a slim ship with an aspect ratio of 1 to 10 that would soon be mimicked by competitors. This slim frame allowed SS Atlantic to cut through the water easily instead of skipping over it. In the 1870s, it was common for steam-powered vessels to retain square-rigged sails just in case coal reserves ran low. This was primarily for comforting, hesitant passengers. SS Atlantic happened to have four square-rigged sails that surrounded the single funnel, as well as one compound steam engine powering a central drive shaft capable of producing 600 horsepower. The ship was able to reach speeds of 14.5 knots with her single screw, which was decently fast for her day. In total, SS Atlantic could accommodate 1,166 passengers and crew, with 10 lifeboats on the lifeboat deck. SS Atlantic and her sisters were the epitome of the posh lifestyle that the upper class strived for. Where Cunard strived for speed and efficiency, White Star Line chose to instead focus on sailing as an experience instead of just a means to an end. This proved to be a successful business strategy they continued to use until the company was dissolved in the 1930s. On board SS Atlantic, there were two class accommodations, cabin or saloon class, which is the equivalent of first class, and steerage class, which is the equivalent of third class. Saloon class was a midships with a large dining saloon measuring 80 feet long and was as wide as a 40 foot beam, reaching sidewall to sidewall. There were luxurious cabins and double suites, including public lavatories fitted with running water and heated by steam things that were considered luxury in the 1870s and is standard for modern day cruising. Steerage accommodations were considered quite bougie for their day, but was the absolute bare minimum by today's standards. Steerage class was denied access to the other decks other than the deck their accommodations were located on, meaning it was quite stuffy, smelly, and lacked air circulation in steerage class. There was a saloon style dining room for steerage that was less plush than the saloon class dining room, but was large and accommodating. Steerage class's sleeping quarters were communal as well, and the entirety of the ship for both steerage and saloon class was split into three sections. The single men were housed at the bow near the engineers and crew members, families were housed in the middle to keep the single men contained, and the single women and children were kept in the stern as far from the single men as possible. 
The classes mingled in their respective dining halls, but after 11 p.m., the strict sleeping arrangements were strongly enforced. All parts of the ship were lit by gas lights, since electricity on ships was still in its most primitive state, and after 11 p.m., it was lights out in the sleeping areas. Despite this seeming like such minimal comforts for modern day folks like us, White Star Line was progressive for the time and people were lining up for SS Atlantic's maiden voyage. SS Atlantic was launched on November 26, 1870 and passed her sea trials, being completed the next year on June 3, 1871. Her maiden voyage from Liverpool to New York City started five days later on June 8th and other than a minor collision in 1871 where the SS Alexandria crashed into her, SS Atlantic had a brilliantly successful and safe career. She was advertised as being, quote, unrivaled in safety, speed, and comfort by White Star Line. And for the early part of her career, she lived up to this hype. However, SS Atlantic would not finish her career as flawlessly as she began it. On March 20th, 1873, SS Atlantic departed on her 19th voyage from Liverpool, England, with 835 passengers, 14 stowaways, and 85 crew on board for a total of 952 people. She stopped in Queenstown, Ireland to pick up Irish immigrants before leaving for America. Early on in the venture, SS Atlantic found herself in favorable weather and was making great time. The first few days seemed like the perfect start to a transatlantic journey. However, by March 23rd, she ran into rough seas and pushed against the wind. As the gale howled across the Atlantic Ocean and the ship rolled in the heavy seas, the air became hot and humid with the stench of vomit as passengers struggled to stomach the churning journey they found themselves embarking on. The floors, especially in the depths of steerage class, became consistently slick and putrid with nauseated passengers' undigested lunches. The menu became reduced to little more than water and other basics like cabin biscuits, which are like a plain homemade cracker, in order to calm the overwhelming amount of sickness. SS Atlantic pushed into the wind, but every day less and less progress was made. During the midst of this storm, a wave broke over her bow and smashed starboard lifeboat number four to smithereens, leaving only nine lifeboats. After seven days pushing forward at half the speed SS Atlantic could normally go, Captain James Williams of SS Atlantic started to worry that they would run out of coal in her coal reserves before making it to her destination. He ordered the galley, or kitchen, to reduce the amount of coal used for cooking to conserve it for the remainder of their journey. Captain James Williams asked the chief engineer, John Foxley, to report on how much coal remained in the coal reserves as they approached North America, roughly two days away from Sandy Hook, New York. In the 1870s, it was common for engineers to overestimate usage and underestimate supplies in order to keep ca the captain cautious about consumption and to anticipate any sort of situation that may prop up. Based upon his previous calculations, Foxley's estimate would have put SS Atlantic in danger of running completely out of coal before reaching New York. This, of course, was not true. It was merely an overestimate. However, if he admitted to Captain Williams that he had been overestimating, he could run the risk of losing his job and tarnishing his reputation. With that in mind, Foxley reported to Captain Williams that they had 127 tons of coal left with his underestimation of coal reserves, even though in reality they had 160 tons. His overestimation of consumption was not something Captain Williams was aware of, so he took this information to heart. 127 tons of coal may sound like a lot. Unfortunately, even in favorable winds and conditions, from where SS Atlantic was at, she would need at least 130 tons of coal to safely reach New York City. Captain Williams found himself in a tough situation. Does he risk running out of coal and drifting aimlessly in the Atlantic Ocean? Or does he bow his head in shame and make a run for Halifax, Nova Scotia to resupply? Either option was bound to be an embarrassment for Williams, being that no White Star Liner had ever had to divert for resupplying. After mulling it over, Williams decides that the safety of his crew and passengers is more important to him than his own good reputation, and he plots a new course for Halifax, Nova Scotia. SS Atlantic headed in the direction of Halifax Harbor, which can be very dangerous to approach. The coastline of Halifax is littered with sandbars, strong currents, and rocky shoals that can spell death for a vessel. And the only way ships at this time could receive guidance into the harbor was either a tugboat or the Sambro Island Lighthouse. And it still stands today as the oldest surviving lighthouse in North America. 
This lighthouse was one of the only ways for captains to know where their vessels were at and where the entrance of the harbor was. Approaching anywhere else was just too risky and could surely spell disaster for any vessel foolish enough to try. Unfortunately for the SS Atlantic, most of the officers had never traveled to Halifax and were blissfully ignorant to the dangers they would soon find themselves in. On the evening of March 31st, 1873, Fierce winds and rough seas lapped at the decks of SS Atlantic as she crept toward the coastline of Halifax. One could surely smell the salty air of the ocean, mixing with the scent of fish from the nearby harbor. A much welcomed difference from the vomitous smell the passengers had unfortunately grown accustomed to by now. As the sun set, the passengers excitedly gathered about the portholes, ready to catch their first glimpse of land in 11 long days. At midnight, second officer Henry Metcalf a fourth officer, John Brown, stepped in to relieve Chief Officer John Firth and third officer Cornelius Brady from their watch at the helm. At 12.20 a.m., Captain Williams arrives at the bridge and calculates that Sambro Island Lighthouse should be visible on the port side by 3 a.m. The officers were instructed that once they saw the Sambro Island light, they were to stop and drop anchor to wait until morning to navigate into the dangerous harbor. Unfortunately for Captain Williams, his estimate for his coordinates were wrong. Sambro Island was actually to their starboard side due to the ship drifting in the heavy current. And with the officers focusing their eyes to the port, they would never notice if Sambro Island Lighthouse came into view on the starboard side of the ship. Captain Williams is heavily criticized for his next decision. He informs second officer Metcalf that he will nap in the chart room and that Metcalf is to wake him if he sees the lighthouse or if 3 a.m. comes, whichever comes first. Captain Williams informs the steward to wake him at 2.40 a.m. and leaves for the chart room where he runs into a journalist and is interviewed before finally falling asleep. Metcalf, either trying to be kind to the captain or blindly stubborn, turns away the captain steward who returns at 2.40 a.m. with a cup of hot cocoa to wake the captain. Metcalf is determined to find the lighthouse on his own, not waking the captain despite time drawing to and passing 3 a.m. By 3 a.m., Metcalf has still not seen Sambro Island Lighthouse. Still, he refuses to wake the captain despite direct orders given to do so. Metcalf is unaware that the SS Atlantic is dangerously close to the rocky shores of Halifax, plowing full steam ahead in rough conditions. In his mind, if they had not yet seen the lighthouse, then they were obviously still a safe distance from the shoreline. Quartermaster Robert Thomas is at the helm steering the ship. What is special about this man is that he was one of the few crew members who had been to Halifax Harbor before and knew of the dangers. He warned Metcalf that they were approaching the shore and reminded him of the dangers, but Metcalf shakes him off. This thinking would prove fatal, as we are about to see. We have reached the time of the sinking. Before I continue, I would like to remind everyone that what you are about to hear does contain details of death death of children, and descriptions of the sinking that may be disturbing to some listeners. And now, back to March 31st, 1873. At around 3.15 a.m., a shout echoes across the water and over the deck of the bridge. Breakers ahead! Metcalf's blood turned to ice and his skin prickled as he realized his mistake too late. The lookouts pointed out the rocky shores of Mars Island off of Lower Prospect, and ahead of them was an enormous rock nicknamed Golden Rule Rock. The irony of the situation of running into a rock called Golden Rule Rock, where the golden rule is to not run into the rock, is not lost upon me, and I'm betting you probably feel the same way. In a panic, Metcalf orders the ship's engines in full reverse and to turn the ship hard to starboard, just trying to desperately pitch the ship off to the port side to avoid the rocks. When using tiller commands, as steamships did back in those days, one would say hard to starboard in order to make a sharp turn to the port, and vice versa. So Metcalf calling to turn hard to starboard when seeing the breakers off the starboard side was actually the correct move. With bated breath, the crew watched SS Atlantic bob frantically in the waves, not turning fast enough to avoid the collision that was bound to happen. The ship rides over submerged rock pilings, ripping out the keel with a startling shudder before crashing into Golden Rule Rock and stopping the ship so quickly that every oil lamp on board was snuffed out in an instant. Now, not only was SS Atlantic in danger, but she was in the dark. The passengers and Captain Williams are instantly awoken upon impact, some being tossed from their beds. 
As Captain Williams hustled back onto the bridge, the beautiful ocean liner that had just lodged herself on the rock began to wail and groan as it swings in the rough seas. Despite the engines being in full reverse, it is no use. SS Atlantic isn't going anywhere. As the stern section swings back toward the shore, it smacks onto another rock below the waterline and grinds the propeller blades off, rendering the ship adrift. The engineers find themselves frantic to turn off the engines and cool the boilers as icy Atlantic Ocean water pours in. If the hot metal of the boilers and the cold water of the ocean meet, it will cause an explosion and kill most everyone on board. The last thing the engineers do before abandoning the flooding engine room is to open the steam vents. At this point in time, SS Atlantic is adrift and the lower decks and stern section in particular are rapidly flooding. Captain Williams issues three orders. Number one, all hands on deck. Stewards flee to wake passengers and bring them to the deck. Two, ready and begin lowering lifeboats as quickly as possible. And three, quartermasters Royland and Speakman to begin firing off the distress rockets as fast as they can. To remind you from earlier, the women and children were housed in the stern of the ship primarily. Below deck, steerage passengers are confused on whether they should head to the lifeboat deck, and even when they feel inclined to do so, feel hesitant to leave their precious valuables behind, and therefore waste the little time they have to get out of the lower decks, bumping around in the dark, searching for their valuables and loved ones. Unfortunately for them, the stairs were not engineered for the mass of panicked people trying to leave, and they become bottlenecked as they hurry to get out, listening to women and children screaming in terror from behind them in the stern section. As the stern floods and it becomes almost impossible to get out, passengers who had managed to get to the boat deck can hear the sounds of whimpering, crying, and wailing as women and children below deck suffer. As the ship floods, it settles onto the rocks more, opening gashes into the sides of the ship. Women and children are sucked out of these openings and dashed about against the rocky shoreline, either drowning or being pummeled to death in the current. As the chaos unfolds below decks, on the boat deck, officers desperately load one of the lifeboats with women and children, lowering it into the ravenous sea below. Unfortunately, not even a well-weathered seaman could have saved this lifeboat, as it was too dashed upon the Atlantic, spilling women and children into the frigid waters. As some of the other lifeboats are being prepared, they're smashed to pieces by the hungry ocean waves, further reducing chances of escape. After these incidents, the lifeboats are deemed unsafe and Captain Williams orders everyone out of the boats. A group of scared men refused to leave one of the boats and before the fighting could end, the ship lurched forward and sent the lifeboat tumbling into the sea, killing every passenger on it, including the cowardly second officer Metcalf. Every other lifeboat on board tumbles into the ocean as the ship is tossed to and fro, passengers scrambling for the high ground toward the bow of the ship. At this time, most of the passengers still remain below decks, fumbling in their cabins. The ship has become increasingly more unstable as it settles onto the rocks, and panicked passengers trample one another trying to reach the top of the stairs. They can hear the distress rockets above the decks bursting in the air raining down white sparks over the rolling ocean waves. The ninth rocket the quartermasters attempt to light explodes on the deck, severely burning their hands and faces. After this, the ship begins to roll and the rest of the rockets tumble overboard. As the ship's stern section becomes loose from the rock it was precariously perched on, it begins to sink and rapidly fills with water. This causes the entire ship to roll 30 degrees to the port side, sending officers and passengers flying into railings or rolling into the sea. Panicked mothers and children now trapped in the doomed stern section of the SS Atlantic begin to wail and scream louder, begging for someone to save them. Several passengers who were clinging to the railing recalled hearing the sounds of the stern section's passengers screaming until all fell eerily quiet after a few moments as one by one they were smothered. At this time, the passengers in the center section of the ship began to realize the real danger they were in as they heard the last of the screaming be snuffed out. With the ship rolled on its side, the midsection and bow section of the ship's passengers began blowing out portholes in order to climb out. Most of the families in midships are unable to get on deck before it sinks into the ocean. Single men and engineers were able to be pulled out through the open portholes, joining everyone else in climbing the rigging and clinging to the railings. As the deck begins to sink out from under them, many were swept to sea. 
The ship lost her footing again, and the masts lined up with the horizon as she tilted further onto her side. This created air pockets within the ship, and some who were still trapped inside drowned inside as the tide rose, being the ship would not sink much more than it already had. Instead, it would settle into the ocean as the tide came in. Waves buffeted the inside of the ship, geysers pouring out of the open portholes. At this time, Captain Williams led some of the remaining crew to a point on the bow, where it was then decided they would run ropes between the ship and Golden Rule Rock in order to evacuate the remaining passengers. This would prove difficult in the pounding surf against the slippery surface of Golden Rule Rock and would take a few men to secure it. Once secured, one by one men began climbing from the ship to Golden Rule Rock desperately clinging to the ropes and praying for rescue. Quartermaster Robert Thomas had been thrown from the ship and somehow made it ashore, running up the shoreline to find help. The distress rockets that had been launched do produce good results. On nearby Mars Island, a family of fishermen, the Clancy family, see the distress rockets and Michael Clancy goes out to investigate. The quartermasters are not organized in launching the rockets and are panicky as they fumble to light them, including the ninth rocket that exploded on deck. Quartermaster Thomas makes it to the Clancy family home, where the Clancy's daughter, Sarah, begins readying the home to take on survivors. At this time, Michael Clancy, the father of the family, has gone about spreading the word and recruiting more nearby residents to begin in assisting in a full-scale rescue. The Clancy's and other local fishermen volunteer their own boats to begin a rescue of the men at Golden Rule Rock, as well as securing lines between the rock and the shore. As survivors make their way to the shore, they are ushered through the Clancy home, where Sarah feeds them soup and allows them to warm themselves in front of the family fireplace. By her estimate, at least 400 people went through their living room that night. The rescue pushes through the early morning hours as the sun begins to break and the full extent of the devastation becomes visible. As the sun rose higher in the sky, Reverend William Ancient, who was the nearby Anglican clergyman at Terence Bay, stumbled upon the scene and saw everyone on the shore collecting the dead and organizing the survivors. He first assumed the rescue was finished until he looked out to the SS Atlantic and noticed three people still in the mizzenmast. First Officer John Firth, a young steward boy, and a woman named Rosa Bateman who had been secured to the mizzenmast by Firth to keep her from drowning. Ancient saw leaving these three as deplorable, and formerly of the Royal Navy, he felt comfortable performing a rescue. He then gathered a small crew on a dinghy and set out to rescue the three trapped individuals. Ancient's heroic efforts were appreciated by Firth and the young steward who were able to be rescued. Rosa Bateman had passed away and was so entangled in the mizzen mast she could not be freed. She was left behind as the others escaped the sea that was once again growing angry. On the shore, as the ship finally began to break apart and settle beneath the waves, the last thing survivors saw was the beautiful young woman tied to the mizzen mast as waves lashed at her face and clothes just before the ship went under. After the rescue was over, the locals took to scrapping and salvaging what they could of the ship. They had moved heaven and earth to save the people they did, and then moved heaven and earth once more to retrieve bodies and salvage the valuables they could. Of the 952 people on board, 535 died, including every woman. Only one child survived, a young man named John Hanley, who was cared for after the incident by the Clancy family's charitable daughter, Sarah Jane O'Reilly. Following the sinking, White Star Line and the Canadian government reimbursed those who had participated in the rescue, as well as paying rewards to those who had been brave enough to take to the sea to rescue survivors. This loss was devastating to White Star Line, and the company nearly went belly up in the wake of the tragedy. There are two grave sites for the victims of Atlantic, the Protestants having been buried in the cemetery near Reverend Ancient's Commune, and the Catholics being buried in the Catholic priest Reverend Martin Mass's Star of the Sea Cemetery. The city of Chicago was so moved by the actions of the citizens of Lower Prospect that they sent rewards to the heroes of the rescue as well as donations for the victims. The wreckage of SS Atlantic is in bits and pieces due to salvaging efforts using explosions and divers at the time removing a lot of usable materials. 
However, she still sits 40 to 60 feet under the water depending upon the tide. A few boilers, some wooden fragments, and other small relics are the only things left behind to tell anyone that a gorgeous ocean liner and many innocent people met a horrific fate there. The SS Atlantic Heritage Park Society is a volunteer-run museum that commemorates the sinking as well as bringing awareness and remembering the liner and her myriad of victims. If you find yourself in Nova Scotia, pay them a visit and help support them. They work tirelessly to give us the information we have on the ship today, as well as preserving artifacts from her. The impact this had on White Star Line goes without saying. This was the first major disaster for them in their history as a company, and would leave a dark stain on the company's reputation, only being further soured by disasters like SS Republic, RMS Titanic, HMHS Britannic, and another ship we have previously discussed, SS Neuronic. SS Atlantic also continues to teach us the importance of coastal navigation to appreciate those who do it well and do it safely. Thank you for tuning in to Shipwreck Sunday. If you liked this episode and are listening on YouTube, please give us a like, leave us a comment, and subscribe to our channel. If you liked this episode and are listening on Spotify, Samsung Podcasts, Amazon Music, or another podcast service, please subscribe for more content and leave us a five-star review as it does help us reach more listeners like you. Tune in next Sunday for the story of the infamous MV Estonia, a cruise ferry that mysteriously sank in the Baltic Sea in 1994 and had an even more mind-boggling government conspiracy following the tragedy. Please also check out our new sister podcast to the show, Slasher Saturday, where we take a deep dive into your favorite horror movies. Thank you so much, have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.